30 years of ICSI, an injection of hope for male infertility. The hashtag for this evening's event is Pet ICSI, and this event has been made possible thanks to the generous support of the Scottish Government. I'm Sarah Norcross, Director of PET, and I'll be chairing this evening's discussion. It has been 30 years now since the birth of the world's first child conceived via intracytoplasmic sperm injection. You can see why the acronym ICSI stuck. It's quite a mouthful. It's its long name. And this is a technique that involves fertilising an egg cell by injecting a single sperm into the egg's interior. And ICSI was pioneered by our first speaker, Professor André van Stertegen and his team over in Brussels. And like many scientific breakthroughs, it took a skilled team and a combination of that skill and drive with a touch of serendipity and, you know, a bit of an accident. And this technique has undoubtedly helped millions of infertile patients, particularly men, for whom conventional IVF may not have worked. Now, ICSI was originally intended to help patients with severe male factor infertility. Um, however, the use of ICSI soon ex was extended really well beyond those initial intended applications. And so it's been used for only mild male factor infertility and even for patients where there's no male factor infertility. And the overuse of ICSI has been criticised for quite a number of years now, um, including by one journal editor who described the situation as a therapeutic illusion on a grand scale. So really quite scathing. So at this event, our expert panel will examine the past, present and future of ICSI and explore questions including when should ICSI be used? Are male fertility patients evaluated in the correct way before practitioners resort to ICSI? Has ICSI been sufficiently well assessed via well-designed randomised controlled trials? I think that this one, next one, is very important. What do we know about the health and fertility of people who were conceived via ICSI? And what methods exist for selecting the sperm that are used for ICSI? Which of these methods is best supported um, by the evidence? And which of these methods may be actually a dubious add-on? It now is a great honour for me to introduce this evening's first speaker, Professor André van Stertegen, the pioneer of intracytoplasmic sperm injection, otherwise known as ICSI. He is an honorary consultant. Um, he was previously uh, the, the lab and scientific director at Brussels IVF, and he is an emeritus professor of embryology and reproductive biology at the Free University of Brussels. I will talk about ICSI, the game changer. I have no conventional competing interest to declare like it is usually when you give a lecture, but you have to know that I was active at Brussels IVF until I became emeritus in 2006. And since then, I'm still an honorary consultant at Brussels IVF. You may remember this paper from July 1992 in The Lancet, where we described the first pregnancies after ICSI. And as you can see there, you see one of my colleagues at the microscope on the left doing the ICSI, and you see in the Petri dish what happens. And there next to it, you have a picture of, you know, the injection needle entered the oocyte where a single sperm was deposited. And you see in the bottom in the top right 30 years the 30th anniversary in fact it was on 14 january 1992 that the first birth occurred after 
this procedure was used. We will talk about a little more about it later. And you see the co-authors of this paper were Jean-Pierre Palermo, who is now at uh, Cornell Medical Center. Um, Hubert Yor is, who was a technician and who currently works for Vitro Life. And then my colleague, Paul De Vrooy and myself, the two of us who started IVF 10 years earlier at Brussels. We had the first birth in November 1983. I, and I think it was maybe Chris who encouraged me to write an editorial at the 20th anniversary of ICSI. And to write this editorial, because at that time I was the editor of Human Reproduction, I followed the mind map. You know, we had this ICSI, but the four critical questions. Why did we start? What did we do? What did we find? What does it mean? And I think this mind map idea was given while I was following a Tim Albert course on teaching people how to write and be successful in writing a paper. And I think these four critical, four questions are critical for a good paper to be successful, to be published. Yes, so we have the development of ICSI. Why did we start? What did we do? What did we found? And what does it mean? And now I will go into detail for each of these points. Why did we start? You will remember that, you know, IVF was there since the end of the 70s and especially the beginning of the 80s. It became worldwide applied and it was proven that for female factor infertility as well as idiopathic infertility, IVF was a good choice and had reasonable success. In case that the in case that the male partner had the low sperm count, we did found out, and it was the experience of all centers that the results of IVF were not very successful. So the question was, is there a way to better assist the fertilization process? Of course, for many of these couples, if it didn't work, their only way to alleviate their infertility was using uh, a sperm donor, artificial insemination with donor sperm. So conventional IVF, so assisted fertilization. And in the mid 80s, people had tried zona dissection, zona drilling, making a hole in the zona, or partial zona dissection. But let's, to make a long story short, it didn't really work. On the other hand, Around that time, there was a group of Singapore with the first author who described a few pregnancies after having introduced between the inner side of the zona pellucida and the outer side of the oocyte membrane a few sperm, and they called that subzonal under the zona insemination. And when we had seen this paper, we found it seemed an interesting thing to pursue. And what have we done by then? We obtained a grant to examine in an experimental model, the mouse, whether we could influence the success of this procedure by inducing the acrosome reaction. And a long story short, again, we worked for about a year about on this, Palermo, Joris, and myself, and it was really successful doing this. And 
successful in the terms not only having fertilization but also living mice, living mice who were able to reproduce themselves afterwards. And with this data in mind, then we went to our ethical committee of the university hospital asking them if we could apply this in the clinic. We got an approval, conditional. Among other things, we had to very well inform the patient that it was a completely novel procedure. And they also requested that we carefully follow up the pregnancies if they occur after this novel procedure, including the follow-up of the pregnancies and the children were required by the approval. And just to the side, we had already, and this was done especially with our colleagues of the Center of Medical Genetics, we had started the follow-up program of conventional IVF children. There was not much data about, and I still remember very well that Bob Edwards, with whom we uh, not collaborated, but we talked a lot, he encouraged us very much to do this. So we could start Susie in Cuckles, where conventional IVF had failed because of too low sperm count. Now, you have to imagine that injection of a single sperm in the almost visual space between the inner side of the zona pellucida and the membrane of the oocyte is quite a tedious job. And it could occur that, well, the sperm didn't stay in this virtual space, but that it entered the membrane of the oocyte and the sperm went in between brackets. We had tried to do that deliberately in mice, but we were never successful having a single a mouse oocyte fertilized when we injected a single mouse sperm because all the oocytes completely were uh, destroyed. We couldn't do it. So we didn't work on that. But there we saw that sometimes in what we called a failed SUSI, we noticed the next morning that we had normal fertilization. And we also noticed that if you look at these fertilized oocytes in the coming days, they were dividing into two, four cells, etc. But this was the first observation. We called it in our records, fail Susie. It sometimes occurred that all oocytes that we had and were undergoing subzonal insemination that we never, that they all failed. There was no fertilization. But also, in the case where the first pregnancy followed, the patient had 12 oocytes. All 12 were undergoing SUSI, but only fertilization was observed after what we had called at that time failed SUSI, and which became then intracytoplasmic sperm injection. The patient became pregnant in the course of 1991, and she delivered the baby on the 14 January 1992. From then on, we were, mere, we were interested in, to see whether you know, it worked better. And so at a certain time, then we were injecting, when we did Susie, a few oocytes already deliberately putting the sperm inside. And so after the first birth of January 1992, and in the coming months, 
when we were doing on our side both SUSI and what we now call ICSI, we were, it became obvious, and can I have the next slide, that the results of ICSI were much better than SUSI. SUSI had results, but it was very fluctuating, not consistent results. While then, with time, we could indicate that, you know, it works very well, this intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And then, when we applied it more and more, and in Brussels, we decided as of July 1992 to apply only ICSI in patients where there was severe male factor infertility and we stopped using SUSI at that time. Our results indicated that for ICSI for these men, the results of that could be compared what had been the case for conventional IVF for female and idiopathic infertility. Even in patients where there was almost no sperm visible in the semen analysis, in a situation which is called cryptozoospermia, we had good results as long as you had uh, a sperm that you could retrieve, that had some signs of vitality, and you could inject it. We then, in the, in the times thereafter, we started to use this also for patients with obstructive azospermia, where normally uh, spermatogenesis is quite normal and you can retrieve the sperm, spermatozoa from the epididymis or even from the tendencies. And also, we try to use it, and it is still done currently, in cases of non-obstructive azospermia. Although the successes there are still limited compared to the other cases where spermatogenesis is normal. normal. And so then, by the time, with the years, Epididymal or testicular sperm was used more and more. We took a deliberate attitude in Brussels that we would be very open about what we have observed. We had many, many visitors. We organized workshops, live video demonstration, and organize them also hands-on workshop with the time. And I must say that I'm still very happy that I was so open in Brussels IVF to show it to all our colleagues. And this reminded me of two situations that I, in my personal life, I had experienced. I was three years at the NIH as a young, clinician scientist, not knowing everything about uh, basic research, but there I could profit of the openness, I would say, of the Bethesda campus to start a career as a scientist. I learned protein chemistry in a lab of a Nobel Prize winner, and so I was so impressed by the open attitude, therefore. The second part of the world where we, at Paul de Vrouw and I had experienced this openness, was in Melbourne, in Monash University, who organized in July uh, 1982 the first ever workshop of, on uh, uh, in vitro fertilization. So, what does it mean? It certainly effective for male factor infertility. As a consequence, artificial insemination with donor sperm was much less needed, and by the time, several millions of children have been born 
after intracytoplasmic like sperm injection. I put here, it's also used for non-male factor infertility, and I think it's part of the discussion that we will have later on. And I have to remind you that when we started using it, we were very strict in the criteria when we would use subzonal insemination later on ICSI. But things changed and very rapidly there was an increase in the uh, usage of uh, ICSI for non-male factor infection. Of course, there are other reasons why I think ICSI is needed and I just want to mention one of them. That's when you have to do an embryo biopsy, I think if you do ICSI, the chance of having a contamination by surrounding sperm cells of remnants of sperm cell DNA or corona cells is much less than uh, when you do ICSI than when you do conventional IVF. And I think in most groups where they do pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and embryo biopsy, ICSI will be used in these patients. So I, I think I said it already, it's more efficient and also we deliberately choose to share our knowledge with our peers. As I mentioned in the next slide, because also I think the openness we had uh, ICSI was thereafter in uh, 93, 94 uh, practiced worldwide. And as I mentioned here, it has been mushrooming. And of course, ejaculated sperm, epididymal and testicular sperm, and some patients with no NOAA, uh, with non obstructive azosperm. And in the discussion, I'm willing to talk about it because there I think we have to admit that in non-obstructive azospermia, the results are, yeah, are better than none, but it's nothing compared to the other uh, indications where it is used. Yeah, in vitro mature oocyte, and as, as I mentioned, in couples undergoing pre-implantation uh, pre genetic testing with biopsy, on day three or day five of cell, it's still the preferred procedure to avoid contamination at the time of biopsy by remains of sperm or cumulus cells when ICSI uh, conventional IVF is used. Okay, I just uh, want to end by showing how the center that we started in 90 has evolved. You see we are quite a number of them in 1986, you see more of them. I think this is the 90s. The number increased. Yes, and then we have a very recent one. Just uh, before uh, I went, uh, we went to the Milano meeting in thing. And I show this picture because everything what I have done here, what I told you was thanks to the very unique way I we were happy to work in Brussels with so many colleagues and from all over the world who came to work with us. Our next speaker this evening is someone who is um, more at the beginning of her career. Uh, we have Dr. Morven Dean, who is a trainee embryologist at Nine Wells Hospital Assisted Conception Unit at Dundee. Morvin was a, uh, awarded the Jean Purdy Prize in 2021 for her research into maximal potential in human sperm. And what I'll try to do tonight is give a brief insight into the indications for ICSI, both from a clinical perspective from within the embryology lab today, and also by reviewing evidence as to when ICSI should be offered. And as well as undergoing my, currently undergoing my training in ICSI in the lab, I have been involved in the development of the British Fertility Society and the 
Association of Reproductive and Clinical Sciences uh, guidelines for indications for ICSI. So hopefully I can give some insight into when we should be offering ICSI in clinical treatment. Now, Professor, er, now, Andrew has nicely described the impressive work that has led to the development of ICSI as a technique. But I'm going to jump ahead 30 years and try to determine where we are today. So ICSI was developed to assist fertilization using micromanipulation. And since the, first, since the birth of the first baby born from ICSI in 1992, we cannot deny that it has transformed the treatment of male infertility, specifically for the most severe cases. And despite the lack of evidence to support its use in non-male factor subfertility, ICSI is currently practiced um, is currently practiced more than conventional IVF globally. And the International Committee of Monitoring ART um, reported that in 2011, 66.5% uh, of ART cases were performed using ICSI. And ESHRA has echoed that where they have produced yearly reports um, showing the distribution of IVF and ICSI cases. And what we can see is that there was a dramatic increase um, of the use of ICSI from about 30 to 40% in 1997, through to 2007, and for the last 10 years, it's been practiced in about 70% of cases in Europe. So what's the issue? Well, there is an increasing concern that ICSI is unnecessarily being offered over conventional IVF with little or no evidence to support its use. And I'm sure, I'm sure Chris may touch on this in more detail. But non-factor groups, including unexplained infertility, advanced maternal age, and low ovarian reserve or low oocyte yields are some of the areas which have seen a dramatic increase in the use of ICSI. And it's considered that this rise in trends could be relate, related to preventing the fear um, of total fertilization failure or poor fertilization failure, or feel poor fertilization um, using conventional IVF as the risk is lower in ICSI. However, it's worth noting that, that um, whilst evidence suggests that fertilization rate may be improved using ICSI, the overall success rates are not improved. So why not just do ICSI for everyone? Well, there are still risks associated with ICSI that we shouldn't ignore. There are the immediate risks of oocyte damage, increased time and costs associated with the procedure, and there are also the unknown risks for offspring developed from ICSI, which we look forward to hearing from Barbara later this evening. So just to give a little overview on what the current guidelines are for ICSI, the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence gives some guidance on when to offer ICSI. They suggest that, or they recommend offering ICSI in patients with severe defects in semen quality, patients who present with obstructive and non-obstructive azospermia, where surgical sperm retrieval would be required. And they say that ICSI should be considered in couples um, where previous IVF treatment has resulted in failed or poor fertilization. The Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority do not specify or enforce any clinical criteria for the use of ICSI but rather ensure that centres provide appropriate information regarding the risks associated with ICSI to patients. And recently, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine published guidelines for the indication of ICSI, which is extremely useful for reviewing the strength of evidence out there to determine when ICSI should be used, and more importantly, when there's um, lack of evidence to suggest it's used. And just, I'm not going to, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into these procedures, but just to make a point that in the last 30 years, there's been a, several uh, ICSI associated techniques that have been developed um, alongside ICSI. And it's important to touch on the fact that none of these techniques are recommended in clinical practice due to the lack of uh, strength of evidence. Um, and this is because most of the cases are small studies or case um, individual case studies. And in some instances, um, they are labeled red on the HFBA traffic light system um, as uh, to avoid for add-ons. And this ultimately comes down to the lack of evidence demonstrating their value in clinical practice. 
it is essential that literature is reviewed appropriately so that recommend recommendations for best practice and clinical indications for ICSI can be developed. And I'm going to try and quickly review some of, a couple of them just now for you. So beginning with male factor, um, there is several areas um, for, as Andrew said, how, why ICSI was developed in the first place. There are several areas in which ICSI is recommended and I would say everyone is in agreement about this. So first of all, generally male factor, but specifically um, severe male factor where semen parameters are significantly impaired, um, uh, ICSI would be recommended. Patients who present with azospermia, where surgical sperm retrieval would be required, um, often present with poorer samples, uh, low motility and poor morphology, so ICSI would be recommended. Global zoospermia is a rare but severe disorder of male infertility, characterised by round-headed sperm lacking an acrosome. Men with global zoospermia can present with total global zoospermia or partial global zoospermia. And ICSI is the treatment offered for these patients. And often patients with total global zoospermia, their fertilization, even with ICSI, is um, low or zero. And then lastly, patients who, um, following conventional IVF, have total failed fertilization or poor fertilization. And this could be characterized by um, published reference values, for example, the Vienna Consensus, that report poor fertilization as uh, less than 25% fertilization when four or more oocytes are present. And even within the male factor group, there is some areas which have conflicting evidence um, to support use of ICSI. So first of all, DNA, sperm DNA fragmentation at, at high levels has been reported to negatively impact sperm function. And in some studies suggest for this reason, ICSI would be recommended. However, there's a series of conflicting papers um, in, lit in literature and therefore further research is required before any recommendations can be made on this. Similarly, mild or moderate male factor infertility is another area for great debate. There are several studies um, out there with conflicting information, some of which um, promote the use of ICSI for these patients, um, and some of which say there's no, no benefit for ICSI from ICSI for the use of these patients. And this could come down to the fact that um, there's varying definitions for mild to moderate male infertility. And there have been, what we need to do to try and um, strengthen the evidence is um, uh, create a large multi-centre randomised control trials. And there's been protocols published for this um, to strengthen evidence that then can make clear recommendations and guide best practice. And now moving on to the other or non-male factor group. There's some areas in which um, X is preferred. We have cryopreserved cryo oocytes or frozen eggs, and this could be groups of patients where um, undergoing fertility preservation or freezing for social reasons. And the reason for um, ICSI would be preferred is because the cumulus, com the cumulus oocyte complex are removed prior to freezing. Similarly, in vitro matured oocytes um, are often uh, had their cumulus removed and therefore ICSI would be a preferred option. And pre-implantation genetic testing, as Andrew mentioned, is ICSI can be the preferred uh, method uh, and this is to prevent uh, sperm DNA contamination. However, I've highlighted these two in grey as there are some studies out there which suggest that uh, IVF could be used in these patient groups, specifically for in vitro maturation, where if in both sites are matured in vitro in their cumulus complexes, um, there is no reason that IVF could not be used, as some studies say. Similarly, pre-implantation genetic testing, some studies suggest that conventional IVF versus ICSI um, does not affect the number of euploid embryos uh, developed, uh, created. Um, but generally the preferred option or preferred treatment is ICSI for these patient groups. And then to look into the area um, of other or non-male factor groups where there's lacking evidence and therefore 
um, not strong enough evidence to, to suggest use of ICSI. So patients that are positive for bloodborne viruses, including HIV, Hep B and Hep C, have been, um, it's been reported or suggested that they may benefit from ICSI to prevent seroconversion. However, literature and guidelines are now um, present to suggest that uh, sufficient or additional washing steps during sperm preparation process processes is sufficient to prevent seroconversion and therefore conventional IVF in these patients um, is, is recommended where appropriate. Prevention of abnormal uh, fertilization, uh, specifically um, an increase in uh, tri triploid um, after fertilization. And this sort of mirrors um, prevention of poor fertilization. So it becomes that fear of um, abnormal fertilization or poor fertilization. So this would be recommended as a second line of treatment, um, ICSI to prevent this, but not as a first. We have advanced maternal age and low oocyte yield. And these two um, sort of go hand in hand, um, as often it can be the older patients that have low oocyte um, numbers expected. And whilst it could be reasonable and understandable that if only one or two oocytes are expected or collected, you want to maximize the chance of fertilization and therefore offer ICSI. However, the literature and evidence suggests that ICSI offers no benefit over conventional IVF in these patient groups, and therefore um, these patients should be offered IVF. The use of frozen sperm. So this, so the freeze thaw process uh, for when using frozen sperm can negatively impact sperm parameters, which can often result in higher conversion to ICSIs. Um, and therefore, it's been, there's been some reports to suggest ICSI for these patients. However, um, not all patients saw, or not all, not the thought process doesn't negatively impact all patients, um, and therefore it should be reviewed on a case-to-case -case basis. And last but not least, um, we have unexplained infertility, which is one of the main groups we've seen the biggest increase um, in or use of ICSI in. And whilst literature is limited in papers which isolate unexplained infertility, there's some stronger evidence for this patient group when combined with non-male factor to suggest that ICSI offers no benefit to um, success over conventional IVF. And again, there's now published um, protocols for large randomized control trials, um, which is a for approaches that we can use to try and strengthen, ev strengthen evidence um, to make clearer uh, recommendations for ICSI. So just to, find this, just to finish off with some considerations, the use of ICSI for severe male factor is justified and undisputed. Use of ICSI for male subfertility and non-male factors remains controversial and unclear. Strong evidence is lacking and should be considered when guiding treatment, and there is a need for large multi-centre randomised control trials. Informed consent and counselling is crucial for patients. And lastly, ICSI should only be used where there is clear evidence for its use. Uh, next up this evening, we have um, Christopher Barrett. He's the coordinator of the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology's Male Reproductive Health Initiative. I, I just wanted to echo or rather uh, tell people how important it was when Andrew was mentioning that the Brussels group were very open in, in presenting their data for ICSI. I mean, that wasn't always usual at the time for other uh, reproductive medicine groups. And it's testament to the quality and the, and the progress that ICSI has made is the openness uh, that Andrew and his team has done. So I just wanted to <laughs> reinforce and let everybody know how important that is in, in science. So I'm going to talk about a, something slightly different. I think we've had a perspective of where we've been in 30 years, et cetera. But I want to try and think for male reproductive health, where we are likely to go in the future. I don't think I have any significant conflicts of interest would change what I would uh, say to you today, but here's a list of those for, for evidence. So what, what I think we should do in the future is actually 
be much more globally connected in how we actually do research and how we do teaching, uh, for example. And, and I, I will give very key examples what I think is, is what is important for us to go forward, for, particularly for male reproductive health. Uh, and I'll take, give ideas about where we've done some small bits of trying to do that and where we can go in the future. So male reproductive health to some degree, uh, and here's a lot of the data for that, has, has sort of fallen a little bit behind progress in female reproductive health. ICSI has, of course, been a dramatic development uh, for male reproductive health. But, but otherwise, we've had many questions we're asking about male reproductive health that we just haven't got the answers for over the last 30 years. So one of them, for example, would be, uh, as there been a decline in sperm counts? That's still discussed in, in, in the literature. We have no clear data on that on a global scale with all of the, the particular groups. The incidence of male infertility is still relatively poorly understood, certainly, again, in, in large geographical regions of the world. Uh, and that a lot of the data on that is actually quite old. We have no new robust diagnostic tests for uh, sperm function, for example. Uh, people often say there's DNA damage assays that are available, but I think as, as, as uh, uh, Morvan's indicated, there are many, many more reviews on DNA damage in sperm than there are actually primary data. And I think that's the challenge for us, a discipline. So there are many dis challenges we face as male reproductive health that we haven't yet got over the hurdle. We haven't yet sort of addressed these uh, questions. Um, and that's out with of the fact, for example, that we still don't have a, a male pill, so to speak. And we've been waiting on that for, for, for quite some time. So the one key example I'll give, which I think really hits home with me personally, is, is the, the challenge of antioxidant treatment and sperm dysfunction. So uh, it's probably now 44 years ago that John Aitken uh, did a fantastic study looking at our generation of reactive oxygen species for human spermatozoa showing damage to the sperm. And therefore, the idea was that then we could treat these men with antioxidants. And, you know, this is this giving just men, all men, antioxidants and not knowing which men to give them has, has been riddled our field for the last sort of 20 and 30 years. There are many companies who sell antioxidant therapy, for example, but it's very unclear if they actually work. And I really thought this was very interesting, John Aitken's recent editorial talking about antioxidant trials, saying actually uh, there is little consensus about how to detect damage and therefore just giving everybody antioxidants. Is, is just crazy. And I think he used the word rampant, which is a very strong word. So I think we're very unclear on what to do 43 years later from the original sort of description. Antioxidants, as far as we know at the moment, don't work. So clearly our experiments to date and our collaborations and our trying to find the answer to something hasn't really worked. You know, We need a different way of thinking about how we work about things. And, and what I would suggest is actually we need to be much more global in how we address issues related to male reproductive health. And I think the one positive, if there has been anything positive from the pandemic, has shown really how we can collaborate and really solve scientific problems. Andrew talked about openness and collaboration. And I think this needs to be on a much bigger scale to address these issues. So the global pandemic, just to remind ourselves, uh, there was a first cluster of patients with a pneumonia type uh, cause uh, identified on the 21st of December 2019. And less than 12 months later, we had a 95% effective vaccine for Pfizer. And that amazing development was taken because people collaborated. There was lots of money for research, but people collaborated. And I think we need to do that in male reproductive health. So one of the ways that we're trying to do that is, is an initiative which Chris and myself, uh, as, as a picture at the, <laughs> the top in Chicago, uh, thought about trying to develop for, for, for really pushing forward for male reproductive health. And this is, this is funded uh, by Escher and we had an ampus, campus workshop a few weeks ago. And the whole idea is to try and think of the bigger problems we have in male reproductive health and to try and sort of think about how we can collaborate and address those together rather than sort of arguing uh, from scraps from the table ourselves. And I'll give two examples where we found interesting data, which I think will set us up for the future. Number one is with Fertility Europe, Chris and, and colleagues uh, with SATU, 
actually uh, did a global questionnaire, which is actually still open uh, via Fertility Europe website, asking men, you know, how likely are you to talk about your infertility? So, so we thought that men are sort of unlikely to talk about their infertility, but we didn't really have high quality data. So this is the first time we have high quality data to suggest that it's not likely or just somewhat likely. And having this data then this allows us to make informed decisions going forward. So that's one example of where we can start to really get global data and, and address things. The second question we often get asked was, was, well, funding for male reproductive health is really low um, and we need more money. Well, any scientist will tell you they need more money. They need a million dollars a day and they, they obviously do that research. But of course, it's no good just saying, you know, it's low. We need to know how low it is and how is the gap we need to develop. So we did a series of papers uh, as part of the Male Reproductive Health Initiative to look at funding for male reproductive health. And it comes as no surprise, but this is quantitative data that in Australia, Germany, United States, United Kingdom, for example, the funding for, for government funding for male reproductive health is less than 1% of government funding. So if we believe that the problem is much bigger than that, and of course there's one in 15 men are subfertile, then clearly there's a gap between funding and the significance of the problem. But a, a, a slight warning uh, related to this slide is the fact that actually people told us, well, female reproduction gets much more funding than male reproduction, and it's a competition. Uh, it turns out that actually the average award isn't greatly different between male and female. The real issue is that reproduction doesn't get the funding it deserves. And that's actually our fault. We need to put our hands up and say, we need to deal with this issue. But we know it now, so that's we've got a quantitative data, so now we can go forward in, in doing that. So there's not just the, the ESHRA, the Male Reproductive Health Initiative, that we, which is a global initiative. There are other initiatives which I think are really important that are just springing up in this, in this arena. And I, sure, I think this is the train of way that we're going to go in the future. So, for example, the national program in Australia is called Healthy Male. It's, it's just an incredible incredible system. It's funded by the Australian government. It's the only one in the world. And they've got amazing information related to healthy male, healthy reproduction for men. And I would strongly encourage anybody to, to go to that website. There's also an EU cost action for mainly for training and for research coordination. But that's the first one that's been funded in andrology and male reproductive health. And that's run by Raphael and EA uh, and Chilla, for example. And they're doing a fantastic job. Only just started, but just trying to then get training and development in, in andrology. So I, my voice in this uh, 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 discussion point, I think, really is that we should, to go forward for male reproductive health, to understand the biology, to understand the clinical significance, to try and develop bio, better biomarkers and non-ART treatment. We need to collaborate. We need to sort of use the example of the pandemic. And, and I think there are many things that we need to sort of try and get together to, to do that. I'm often asked, well, you know, by the audience, so what can I do to help with this? Well, one of the things you do is find out what's happening in male reproductive health in your region or your country. You know, how many same analysis is happening? What's training for andrologists? What are your, what are your local societies doing for male reproductive health? Are they just talking about it or actually they're doing something? And that's a big difference. And I think that gap is always an interesting one. Um, you know, you could find out what's the incidence of men suffering from infertility in your region. You know, for example, if you're working in South America, that would be great. And Monica uh, uh, is doing a fantastic job trying to, trying to coordinate that. So, so I think as my last, uh, uh, last but one slide, I, I would suggest that for if we look forward for male reproductive health, we, we've got a very bright future ahead of us. Uh, I think we'll have some great diagnostics. There's some fantastic technology available. I think there's some great experiments being done on male contraception. I was a Bill, at a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation meeting last week in Brussels, and, and progress is just, just incredible. Um, but that's because people are coordinating. That's because people are talking to each other and the funding's coming in. And that's where the Gates Foundation is fantastic like that. They've got a male contraceptive network, a uh, global network, actually. And, and 
that's the way we need to think about in the future to address the questions that we, we have and, and how we can go forward. And of course, you know, I've got the privilege of uh, just talking to you here, but it's the people behind that do, do the work uh, while I'm, I'm away. So um, I'm very grateful to the team back home, Sarah, Vanessa, the clinicians, et cetera. And there's a picture more, more of a center in the reproductive <laughs> group uh, uh, when she was a PhD student with us. And I'm also very grateful for the NHS Scotland as part of NHS research, which is we're very networked in Scotland to do research work. And I think that's great, a great initiative by the government. And obviously I'm grateful for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for funding our, our work. So a very warm welcome to Barbara Luke. Barbara is Professor of Obstetrics and Gynaecology at Michigan State University. Barbara is the author of many books, um, including when you're expecting twins, triplets or quads, and every pregnant woman's guide to preventing premature birth. I'm going to give you some interesting research. Um, in the US, I'm gonna to talk to you today about the risk of birth defects and childhood cancer with conception by ART, focusing on ICSI. In the US, the number of art cycles has increased nearly fivefold over the past 20 years. And currently more than 320,000 cycles are performed. And in the last 10 years, the last decade, about a third of all those cycles are freeze all. So there are dramatic effects that are occurring in IVF treatment, ART treatment in the US. Um, during these periods, during the past 20 years, the proportion of cycles with male factor infertility has been stable at about 17 to 22 percent, whereas the proportion of cycles using ICSI has increased from 60 to 77 percent. I'm going to speak to you about two large NIH grants that we've run in the last decade. The first we did with 14 states in the United States, and these 14 states had the largest number of IVF births. We focused on uh, childhood cancer in this study, uh, and we found that out of 275,000 IVF conceived children, there were only about 321 cancers and about 2.2 million non-IVF conceived children, there are about 2,000 cancers. The overall cancer rate per million person years for IVF was 251 versus 192 for non-IVF. So the hazard ratio was about 1.17, 17% increased risk, but the confidence interval crossed one. What we found was that the rate of hepatic tumors was higher in IVF children with a hazard ratio of 2.46. And this has been shown in other studies around the world as well. And the rate of embroinal tumors was also higher with a hazard ratio of 1.28. Now we have continued this study and we're looking at both childhood cancers and birth defects because of a common pathological feature. Some of these possible etiologies include epigenetic changes induced by repeated hormonal exposure, freezing and thawing of gametes and embryos, micromanipulation, the growth condition of the embryos, delayed implantation, and factors related to underlying subfertility. Now, cancer rates in the US, it's a U shaped curve in childhood. You can see on the left is from birth to 19 years of age. And the highest rate is in infancy, in that first year of life, reaching a low point in five to nine years, and then rising again in adolescence and young adulthood. Now, this childhood cancer is here in red on the right-hand side of the screen. And you can see the story just begins. There's a need to track these children over time because the cancer rate continues to climb. 
Now we've continued this study looking at the combination of birth defects and cancer. This study was published in JAMA in 2020. We, we've continued this study in four states. And these four states were chosen because they have similar um, data collection for birth defects. They use the same techniques and definitions. That's Massachusetts, New York, North Carolina, and Texas. What we found comparing, these are singletons, comparing uh, naturally conceived children to IVF conceived children, is that the baseline cancer rate is higher in IVF children with, without birth defects, with birth defects, whether they're non-chromosomal or chromosomal. And you can see the hazard ratio is at least twice as great for IVF births. What is important is the number of birth defects and the kinds of birth defects. And in everything we examined, IVF children were at greater risk. In 2021, we published a large study from this, this four-state consortium looking at the effect of ICSI as well as male factor uh, on the rate of major non-chromosomal birth defects. We looked at blastogenesis defects, those that are occurring in the first four weeks after gestation, after conception. Cardiovascular is one of the first organs to form, and among male infants, general urinary defects, primarily hypospadias. And what we looked at, again, this is singletons. These were all autologous, uh, fresh cycles without ICSI, the risk of a major non-chromosomal defect was 18% higher. With ICSI, but without male factor, it was 30% higher. And in the presence of both ICSI and male factor, the, it was, the risk was highest, 42% greater. The risks were also increased for blastogenesis and cardiovascular and among uh, male infants for genital urinary defects. Now, our most recent paper was just published in, was published in September, but the print uh, version was in the November issue of Human Reproduction. Uh, in this, we had our final data, COVID delayed getting data from the states. The risk of childhood cancer, we, we concluded, had two independent components, one by method of conception and the other by the presence, type, and number of birth defects. And the two components of this risk were independent and therefore their coefficients were multiplicative. Let me show you that data. You can see here are the hazard ratios of cancer by method of conception and birth defect status number and type. And you can, I'm comparing here because our largest uh, group was autologous. We had about 95,000 uh, IVF conceived children from autologous cycles. You can see the risk of cancer compared to naturally conceived children was about 30% higher among fresh uh, autologous cycles. The risk for CNS tumors it's about 67% higher, and solid tumors, about 38% higher. Now, for all children in this study, the risk of cancer with one non-chromosomal birth defect was almost three times higher in the presence of one non-chromosomal defect. The presence of two or more increased that risk to 4.48. Now, as I said before, the risk involves two components. One is the method of conception. The other is birth defect status. So basically, children conceived from IVF with fresh autologous, in a fresh autologous cycle, having one uh, non-chromosomal birth defect actually have a risk closer to 3.5. So the unanswered questions and future challenges are, will art conceived children have greater morbidity risks? Will there be a rise in major birth defects in the years to come? 
Will there be a rise in childhood cancers? And as we continue to track these children over time, will there be a rise in adult cancers? Just want to thank some of my research partners, Mort Brown at University of Michigan, many individuals across the country, and of course, the states that have participated, both the health departments, the cancer registries, and birth defect registries. Um, I'm delighted to say that we have um, an extra person joining us for the Q&A because we'll be joined by um, Inga Liebers, who is Emeritus Professor of Medical Genetics at the Free University of Brussels. And uh, her publications include many, many papers on genes involved in male infertility, um, follow up of pregnancies and, and children born after assisted um, reproduction, and as well on pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. In addition to that, she's been a member of the Belgian Advisory Committee for Bioethics. Um, now you'll notice um, that um, when she spotlighted that she is um, sitting next to Andre, um, and that um, uh, viewers is because uh, she's she's married to him. I'm going to go to the first question now from the audience, which is uh, Victoria Gazard, um, and she says, "I'm wondering why patients with poor semen analysis results are rarely, um, if not ever, given three months to make diet and lifestyle changes to improve results. Instead, it seems that ICSI is offered and thus completely disempowers men to make changes that can affect um, a healthy pregnancy and baby." Uh, may I ask um, what the consultants here um, have offer advice and guidance and a three month plus window to maximise sperm quality? So I think I might go to Chris first on um, the whether, you know, what difference diet and lifestyle changes could possibly make. Yeah, and, and that's a very important point. I think that are there are some data to show that diet and lifestyle do make a difference. So, of course, there's the, there's the traditional advice about stop drinking, stop smoking, um, uh, maintain a healthy weight, etc. Get lots of sleep. Uh, I think all those things are just rational to maintain somatic as well as germ cell uh, uh, healthy uh, body, basically. So I think that is an important aspect to do that. But there are challenges with that. I think one is is quantitating that information. You know, we need better studies to give quantita quantitation to that. And the second issue is that some of these things are not very easy for patients. You know, we say for the patients, oh, you know, go go away and lose 30 kilos or something or 20 kilos. It's not very easy to do that for, for a patient. So I think we need to have a very supportive environment for us to be able to do that. Mm. So I think there are a series of things that we could do um, but we do need better information to help that patient. We need better uh, detail of how best to support patients to do these lifestyle changes, because some of them are not that actually easy to do. It's easy to say it, and the formula is clear, but doing it, is, it takes some challenges. So we'll move on to the next question, um, which is from Charlotte Lamb, who asks, what is the evidence for the use of ICSI in males with poor sperm morphology, particularly when this is 3%? Does ICSI improve fertilization in these patients? I also wonder whether ICSI should be used in males with um, used in males with a history of ICSI samples, but with more recent IVF quality samples. I'm not quite sure what that means. I'm hoping the panel do. Um, is there evidence that these patients have a higher risk of failed fertilisation with IVF? So I think the evidence of low morphology and indication for ICSI kind of falls into that mild to moderate male factor group. Um, and some of the studies suggest ICSI would be beneficial and other studies suggest not. And it comes down to this kind of clear de definition and maybe isolated parameters, um, which isn't so clear in literature or conflicting in literature. Um, as for well, the, the part about, if I think, is that if they've had ICSI previously and they come back with an improved sample, would IVF be offered? Um, I'm not sure. I think from a lab embryologist perspective, perspective quite often it can be 
one sixty always sixty. But when there's a change in semen parameters, if I'm not one hundred percent sure to be honest in that, that's um, I don't have the answer for that. <laughs> okay, so the next question is from Ricardo Ask, um, who's um, full of praise for um, Andre and sends his um, very best regards to you and the original team. Uh, and he says his question is. Um, uh, if you believe um, that, like written in some PubMed, Google Scholar, Scopus databases, the TICSI could be associated with diverse um, health problems, um, I'm particularly interested in the increase of children with ASD, autism spectrum disorder, uh, that in my personal experience is a very significant possibility. And he says, thanks very much and congrats and all that congratulations and all those sorts of things. But yes, have you, um, you what do you think about those issues and particularly about um, the autism spectrum disorder, Andre? Well, I think it's an interesting question, but I think so far, as far as I know, I haven't seen real data about the occurrence of um, autism spectrum disorders among children after uh, all kinds of assisted conception. Because I think I wanted also to indicate that large studies have been done comparing conventional IVF children and ICSI children. And although some cases it's a little bit more, but overall, the occurrence of problems, if I may say, in the broad spectrum is quite similar between conventional IVF and ICSI children. Of course, we have to realize that nowadays ICSI is done with normal sperm and with deficient sperm. Because I just want to recall a little history. In the beginning, when we were going to do a patient with Susie and Ixi, we discussed a lot on the semen analysis to see whether he was really a candidate to come into it. But as you know how things go, it evolved a lot. And nowadays, I think we have to realize that then we saw the pictures also showing uh, by uh, the colleague embryologist about the occurrence of ICSI is 70% in Europe also. And of course, there are, it, it's more complicated than that. When I discuss it with my clinical colleagues, they say, for instance, that factors like costs interfere. Now cost depends on the country where you are living. We live in Belgium and we are fortunate that social security is very generous for couples. So the cost of doing an ART cycle is free of almost free for six cycles, depending on the age, etc. There are certain factors. But you have to realize, and that's what my colleagues clinicians say, when a patient is at cycle number five, then, okay, they may insist, rightly or wrongly, I'm not saying that, that ICSI should be used because, you know, there is sometimes a perception, but it's not based on strong data. And I'm also in favor of doing the studies to see whether really there is a benefit. But we should not forget that it is, there are many factors involving in the way uh, a, a, a cycle will be done, either conventional idea of, of ICSI. And I'm just giving that example of Belgium with the six cycles reimbursed, which is very good, I think, because there are not many countries around the world where this is done. And there is no difference 
in the price for IVF or ICSI is the same. It's the same reimbursement. That's a really interesting point. And and um in Scotland in the UK is the has offers the best um state funded provision of fertility treatment. Um and they give up to three cycles to the to the patients that are, yeah, yeah. are eligible. Um now um Ricardo had this, you know, the same question um for you, Barbara, as well. Um and I don't know whether um that you've looked at um those sort of um, autism spectrum disorders as part of your um, data analysis yeah. um, so that these things can be quite hard to define as well so that could so I guess pose a challenge for you but um the the challenge in the U.S. we have several challenges but both cancer and birth defects are reportable uh, on the state level uh, and cancer in particular is uh very, um, the reporting of cancer is, is very uniform in the US. Birth defects depends on the state. There is active and passive surveillance. And those four states I included were all active surveillance and members of the CDC um, surveillance group. So they, they really have the highest standards. Things like autism are not, uh, reportable uh, diseases in childhood. Um, so it's capturing those kinds of illnesses. And in the US, it's a very mobile society, if you go from one state to another, your medical records don't follow you. So if a child is born in one state and the family moves to another state, we don't, we have a difficulty following the health of that child. Could the higher incidence of cancer in children born from IVF be a result of any condition that causes infertility in their parents, which may predispose them to cancer, such as older parents, BRCA-like mutations, poor gametes? Um, we have begun collaborations with a group in Baylor, led by Philip Lupo, who has uh, done a number of pro projects looking at the co-occurrence of birth defect and cancer. What is interesting is that they tend to be in the same organ system, that a birth defect uh, of the GI tract is associated with uh, hepatic cancer. So how that growth is early affects not only a birth defect, but also subsequent risk of cancer. But certainly the health of the, of the parents is paramount. That's the foundation that the pregnancy begins with. And all of the factors that are affecting conception with IVF are important to consider. It's challenging to study this though, because the therapies for IVF are always changing. And in order to get enough children to study and small sample size, it's probably the single biggest flaw in many research projects to look at enough sample size Many studies go back decades in IVF, and the therapy has changed dramatically. Uh, even recently, it's changed dramatically. It's always difficult to do studies. Uh, the studies that are needed, having enough uh, children in each group, and moreover, the funding for doing the studies is very difficult to get these days. And although everyone says there should be follow-up studies, which I agree upon, the money to do the studies don't fo doesn't follow. And because children don't mm -hmm. vote, politicians often don't fund child health. Um, it's a very short-sighted mm -hmm. view because it's children who grow up and support, you know, us as we get older. Um, but it's it's true. Um, but to to collect more contemporary data at more regions would be ideal. And that, that has been voiced today uh, by several speakers. I'm going to move on now to another question. This one's from anonymous attendee and it's for, um, for Chris. Um, the person says, perhaps I missed it, but is the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funding concerning funding provided for male reproduction or for male contraception? 
My assumption is it must be for contraception. If I'm correct, do you think the foundation will jump over to male reproduction if you're successful? Uh, or can you show that whatever you're looking at with your grant also has an impact on male reproduction? And then an, um, an, another question, they've been sneaky and got another one in as well, um, asking, is China funding male reproduction studies at a higher level than you've shown for the UK? UK, US, Australia, or etc. Okay, I can answer the last one first because David Chan from uh, uh, Hong Kong presented data at the Escher campus workshop uh, in early October, and it's substantially more. Yes, I think it's uh, to just under three percent. So it's it's really quite a lot more, and and he demonstrated quite clearly how powerful that have been. Um, to answer the first question, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funding that we have is, is a Global Challenges Grant. $3 million and it's related to male contraception. But what it is doing is looking at human sperm function and how to interrupt that function. But of course, there, there's flip sides of the same coin. So we understand sperm biology by using, for example, compounds. And therefore, we could understand sperm function and we can look at um, infertility and then try and mimic infertility for contraception. So although the funding is for male contraception, I, intellectually in my brain I don't think of them as differently we're trying to understand how a cell works we're trying to interrupt it or increase it you know it's the same side of the coin really great um so the next question I'm going for is from Alistair McClure who's asked a number of questions um I don't think I'll get through them all Alistair but I'm going to go with this one um in the clinical laboratory there are great incentives to avoid the risk of failed fertilization by using IVF um, rather than ICSI. The patient will lose their chance and the lab will have failed. Never mind the additional profit the unit will gain by doing ICSI. A failure mode and eff effects analysis will always point to ICSI when deciding whether to do IVF or ICSI. How can lab managers be incentivized to choose IVF where appropriate. So, uh, Morvin, I think um, I think perhaps you can have the first stab at this, and then we'll uh, you can hand it, hand over the baton. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a good question. I think it's a lot of thought process needs to go into. It. I think one of the things it's it, it becomes this kind of what I mentioned in the talk. It's the fear of failed fertilization, this fear, so ICSI becomes a safety blanket, but then there's also reason with that, as Alistair mentioned, so if you're preventing um, another cycle. Um, I think one of the things that the lab, well, lab managers, not that I am one, is that is kind of what we mentioned about evidence-based practice, and that's, yes, there's financial implications, but that that's not following evidence-based practice and that's what's lacking in literature. So if we can focus on kind of improving our knowledge and with um, improved trials um, and then make clear recommendations and guidelines, then that can be used to drive IVF over ICSI. Does anyone else want to come in on that? Andre? Yeah. Yes, I think it's, it's a question that has been around since the beginning. You know, the, the dialogue between the clinic and the laboratory, between the laboratory and the clinic is crucial. I think it's, um, it's easy to blame uh, failures to one of the partners, that's the wrong policy. You have to discuss and try to see when, there's, when there is a problem arising in the activity. And I'm not talking about what's going on now at Brussels IVM because I'm not involved. But I go back to, to previous time. Yes, we all went through phases when the success of fertilization seem to be lower for a certain period. But then I think it's a question to get around the table and look at the data and see whether you can find a reason why 
such or that other part happens. But many times it comes and goes, and I think it's it's very difficult sometimes to pinpoint uh, what is the reason why a certain event happens in the lab. But I think a crucial point is that the clinicians and the embryologists should really discuss regularly about what's going on on both sides, I would say. Thanks, Andre. Um, so the next question is from someone who's chosen to be anonymous, and it's for, um, for you, Barbara. Um, and they say the odds ratios were impressive. However, what are the actual number of IVF children per population born with these abnormalities? What is the differenti differential in this number compared to non-IVF children populations? Also, were the data segregated with respect to the cause um, of infertility or rather the need for IVF? And would this have been helpful um, in your analysis? Well, we these are population-based studies. Um, they're all, and we have sample sizes in there. The last that I showed you was 165,000 ART children. Um, and compared to 1.35 million naturally conceived children. I only had 10 minutes, so I couldn't go into depth. The paper is 18 pages long. It's what I love about human reproduction. They do let you have many tables and go into great detail. We controlled for many things. I suggest looking at these papers, these four papers. Um, we do go into um, infertility diagnoses. Um, the models control for many factors. Uh, I mean, that's why we, we have published four papers in a row, each with an expanding uh, data set. For each IVF child, we asked each state to give us the next 10 naturally conceived children. We also looked at the naturally conceived siblings of ART conceived children to look at perhaps familial factors. Um, and that's an important comparison group to look at. Um, we also looked at ovulation induction and intrauterine insemination. And that is halfway between the risk between IVF and naturally conceived children. So it's a very complicated issue. And we, we have done as much as we can with, with uh, the states that we, we've worked with and with the funding that we've had. Regardless of the risks associated with ART, do the speakers feel that um, a desperate childless couple would refuse treatment due to the due to an increased risk of birth defects or uh, childhood cancers? So um, I don't know who wants to to go for that one first. Perhaps we'll go to uh, we'll go Andre, Chris, Morvan, and then Barbara. Yeah. Well, I think that it is extremely important to counsel the patients and tell them before they start, yes, these are the current data on the health of the children. And I think it shouldn't be a catastrophic view about it, but you should tell them that there is a slight increase in general, I would say, in, malform in birth defects and later on, it comes out too. Not that we did see in the small studies later on in the age in the children itself, that it is really catastrophic. But I think it's important to inform the couples and tell them that it may occur. Of course, there have also been studies, for instance, not looking at um, at 
one of the methods, IVF, XC, insemination, about just the time to pregnancy, the longer periods patients needed to have a, a, a spontaneous pregnancy, also in this group of patients, the number of malformations, the number of problems, let me say it like that, increase, which indicates that probably the fact of being infertile itself may be already a factor influencing the outcome, which is also the case in cancer, et cetera, et cetera, I think. Okay, Chris, what do you think about that? No, I think uh, Andre's uh, summarized that very well. I think it's it's patient information and and is is absolutely critical. I think one of the challenges is 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 for example the data that Barb has presented. How how much is that getting transmitted in this day and age to the patients? And I think that's the key part and the context of that. Uh, I think that would be an interesting uh, project to to see between now and Christmas, for example. Morvin, is there anything you wish to add? Um, yeah, I think I would just echo that. I think in, like informing patients is key, but also offering counselling for patients. So if you're if we're giving them this information, they need to understand it in a way and have counselling if they want it. I think the question will be whether I think it would affect couples or change couples' minds. I think no, I think couples would still come through for treatment with knowing the risks but it's critical that we inform them of those risks and offer them counselling where appropriate. Barbara before I'm going to see you to answer this question I'm going to tag on one of Alistair McClure's other questions um, for you because it sort of it is really relevant to this one because he asks um, do you think that more education about the risks involved can be promoted or even enforced in this multi-million dollar industry? Um, so first of all, put you, you know, put yourself in the, the sort of the patient shoes and then think about how that education could potentially um, work in practice. Well, risk, risk is always an interesting concept to try to transmit to individuals. You know, when it happens to you, it's 100%. You either have cancer or you don't have cancer. You know, in the March of Dimes, which is our national organization for birth defects, their motto used to be a birth defect is forever. Let me just put the numbers in perspective. Um, in, in 2019, there were about 84,000 ART children conceived, born in the United States. And this is in the paper that came out today. Of those children, if we applied those risks to them, 761 had a major birth defect, 31 had cancer, and 11 out of that 84,000 had both birth defect and cancer. So does that put these numbers in a different perspective? And I, I think we do need to work on transmitting risk and how explaining risk, it's, it's very challenging. Um, and for individuals who themselves have ever had cancer, I think the idea of risk strikes home. But take that 84,000 live births from ART in the US in one single year and look at those numbers. I hope that helps. Yeah, I, that's is a really excellent point. And it comes up time and time again, um, is that understanding and communication um, of risk and different people's attitudes depending on their life experience towards those risks as well. Um, so I, I think that you know that is a you know a huge thing. It comes up particularly in the in the sort of the genetics and genomics part of our work as well. Um, so um, we're getting close to the end. So I'm going to go with this um, 
this question this question perhaps is our last one um which is for andre and chris um it says well andre and chris made such a good point about the importance of openness with knowledge we all benefited um from these decisions um how do the speakers think we can move away from profiteering with ivf and ICSI and re-establish the idea that knowledge should be circulated openly i've been for many 50 years practicing some kind of medicine and things have changed a lot you know when i in in general now when i see the way medicine is practiced now the money comes into it more and more every year i think it's I think in my view, it becomes really a problem that, you know, so much attention is focused on also in the university hospital, you have to make money. And so those things interfere a lot. I think it's, I started to work and my wife too full time at university and we were a salaried people. We were, you know, we had the fixed salary. Nowadays in hospitals to find the proper specialist, they don't accept anymore to work on a fixed salary. They want to have more freedom and charge whatever they can and charge more. So I think this is a general evolution that happens in medicine in general, and also, I think, especially maybe in the field of, uh, you know, infertility uh, treatment over the years. There is a lot of change that happens. And I don't know very much what happens in the States, but I remember, you know, in the beginning where we were charging a few hundred euros to the patients in the beginning when ICSI and IVF was not reimbursed, it was already thousands of dollars for a cycle going on in the States. And, you know, it's, the health system is very different can't make progress unless we collaborate you know it's just going to be impossible and i think the way one of the ways to look at that is to talk to the funding bodies about uh, networks etc because the funding bodies want to fund the best science and they want to get answers to questions so i think that's the key part to think of of doing that there's always going to be reluctance in ivf clinics to do research on all, all the questions we just mentioned but i i think hopefully we've moved past that sort of uh, barrier i hope anyway I, 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 we have no choice we're never going to answer some of these questions unless we get our act together and the only way to get our act together is actually to collaborate and then address those questions and talk to the funding yeah. bodies it is impossible otherwise